Okay, welcome to the Friday Transportation Seminar at Portland State University. I'm Chris Monsier. I'm a faculty member in Civil and Environmental Engineering, and with uh, Dr. Jenny Liu in the back there, we co-organized the Friday Transportation Seminar. I'm going to pass around the sign-in sheet for students in the class. Make sure it gets back to me in the back. And we wanted to remind you if you're uh, the written assignments, uh, we, we don't have no we have no class next week because of Thanksgiving. So there's no seminar next week, but the written assignments are due the Tuesday of finals week, so make sure you review what those are uh, for credit. If you're submitting them to CE, there's a drop box on the D2L site. If you're in the CE class, submit them to me. A PDF, please, uh, there. And Jenny, what are, just email them, email them to Dr. Liu. So, okay, uh, with that, uh, I'm proud to introduce uh, Nick Foster. He's a senior planner. Uh, with Kittleson Associates. Uh, he's going to present to you today on uh, some work he did here for his master's thesis on developing a level of service model for protected bike lanes. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Nick. And he says that his young daughter has been keeping him up uh, on their trip here. So he's all pumped up on caffeine, ready to give a great presentation. So, Thanks, Chris. Thank you, everyone, for coming out today. It's good to be back here at Portland State. There's a few familiar faces in the audience I'm happy to see. Um, so with that, as Chris mentioned, I'm going to talk about uh, what I did for my master's thesis here at PSU, which was uh, developing a level of service model for protected bike lanes. Um, so today, I'll give you a little bit of introduction into what, uh, what and why we want to measure level of service for bike lanes, what protected bike lanes even are, if you don't already know. Um, talk about some of the previous research that's been done in this area, both uh, here in the U.S. as well as internationally. Um, describe how we went about doing this project, uh, complete with a little bit of video examples of what we showed to people. Uh, and then I'll discuss what we end up coming out of it and how it could potentially be used in practice and what its implications might be for future research. Um, so, as you know, it's a level of service model for protected bike lanes. Um, the goal was to look for a model that was only for segments only, just keeping it simple for a first step. So as we go through this, um, what I'm talking about does not include signalized intersections or things like that. Um, and the goal is to develop some type of model that used readily available data inputs. So we weren't trying to come up with a very complicated long form model that would take you know, hours of data collection for a single street segment, but something that was readily available to engineers and planners that could be implemented with reasonable accuracy and precision. Um, and secondarily, we wanted to see how these types of facilities compared to other types of bike facilities, whether it was uh, bike lane, standard bike lanes, bike boulevards, or shared streets. So for those of you who don't know, protected bike lanes are any type of bike lane that is physically separated from motor vehicle traffic by some type of vertical element. So that could be planter strips, like you see on Multnomah Street here in Portland. It could be flexible posts, uh, like this example here is from Washington, D.C. Or it could be parked cars, like we have on Broadway Street here through campus. Um, some people also call them cycle tracks. That's, that's a term that is used commonly in the engineering community that's kind of going out of favor. Um, Federal Highway Administration is going to start calling them separated bike lanes. So there's going to be all kinds of words going around depending on who you listen to. Um, so when we talk about level of service for bike facilities, what we're typically talking about is not the same level of service you hear about for motor vehicles, which is you know, based on delay. We're talking more about user perceptions. Um, so you also sometimes hear a level of service for this type of situation called quality of service. Um, it's Interchangeably, people are trying to measure what they call comfort or stress or how safe people feel. Um, so it's more about you know, that type of situation as opposed to is there enough capacity in the bike lane to move traffic through. It's more how comfortable do I feel riding here given what's going on around me. And typically, for reporting purposes, since people seem to understand it, uh, most models out there use an A through F scale, similar to what's used for autos. Uh, a big reason for wanting to take on a project like this is that more and more we're seeing interest from agencies in how do we measure the performance of our system, and not just for mottos, which we've done for a long time now, but how do we measure the performance of systems for bicyclists, pedestrians, and transit riders. Um, some that's been facilitated by the 2010 Highway Capacity Manual, which has measures for these different modes. Um, other agencies are looking at developing their own measures as well. 
And th for these types of facilities in particular, there's not a model based on North American data. Uh, we have, as I'll show you later, we have models based on international data, and we have some opinions about how these models might look or what types of, um, how people would perceive uh, protected bike lanes, but there was no North American based uh, model. So talking about the previous research, here are a few examples of some commonly used bicycle uh, quality of service level of service measures. Um, the most common one is listed at the top of the table. The highway capacity manual has a bicycle level of service model. Um, and it was, you'll see with a lot of these, they're developed with a range of 60 to, in the case of Denmark, where it was a pretty intensive uh, and well-funded effort. Um, 400 people participated in taking these surveys, um, and they show a very number of sites ranging from 30 up to 78 uh, for the Federal Highway Administration's Bicycle Compatibility Index. Um, but you also see at the bottom there's two that are not based on data, level of traffic stress, which came out of San Jose State University and Northeastern University. Um, it's commonly used for network planning purposes, and it's based largely on the opinions of the authors as well as Dutch cycling guidance. Um, and what's worth noting is that other than the Danish model and level of traffic stress, none of these other models outright predict uh, level of service for, for protected bike lanes. So it's only, you can use the Danish model or you can use level of traffic stress. Uh, common features that are considered by all these models are probably what you would expect if you've ever bicycled on a street before. It's your interactions with motor vehicle traffic are an important thing. You know, how much traffic's on the road, how fast is that traffic going, and how much space are you sharing on that road with the traffic? Uh, you know, do you have a bike lane or do you not have a bike lane? If so, how wide is it? How wide is the lane next to you? Um, those are the types of things that they have found, are, you know, as you might intuitively understand, are important to people bicycling. Um, a little bit less so than, say, capacity or delay along the way, depending on the area you're on people across the Hawthorne Bridge may feel a little bit differently about that. But, so now I'll talk a little bit about how I went about creating the model. It's for, um, for our methods, we followed uh, what has been done in a lot of other studies, which is where you take video at a bicyclist eye level of different types of bicycle facilities. So I hooked, whoop, I hooked up a GoPro camera to a metal pole and put it on a bike and rode around different protected bike lanes and other types of facilities in San Francisco, Chicago, and here in Portland. Um, and from that, reduced the, the video down into clips that m made sense for people to be able to watch and rate later on. So we had two general groups. We had my protected bike lane clips, and then I had my reference clips of you know, regular bike lanes, um, shared streets, to kind of get a feel for how you know, if I couldn't make a model work in the end, I wanted to at least be able to know, well, what's the relative preference that people feel? Um, trying to keep the clips uh, relatively brief. Uh, part of that was to get a certain number of them in in a viewing session that was manageable. And the other reality was we were trying to go for in-between intersections, and you can only bicycle so long without hitting a major signalized intersection on most of these routes. So we wound up with clips about 20 to 30 seconds in length. Um, used a total of 23 clips, only showing 20 at a time. We had three that we decided after the first round of showings were redundant, so we kicked them out and put three new ones in. Um, in selecting the clips, I looked for a few things that I thought would be major differentiators uh, between different types of bike, protected bike lanes. Uh, the first just being what type of physical buffer is in between the bike lane and motor vehicle traffic. So I wanted to get parked cars, posts, um, planters. Just get a feel, does that influence how people think they would feel in a protected bike lane? And then, you know, I've heard concerns before from people that, you know, they feel different on a one-way facility versus a two-way bike lane. And so I wanted to get a little variety of having some one-way bike lanes and some two-way bike lanes. And also trying to get a good range of traffic volumes in there so we could see, you know, does it feel different in a protected bike lane on a busy street versus, say, a more calm street in a neighborhood? And here are some screenshots of different clips uh, from the protected bike lanes. So I had three clips of Northeast Multnomah Street here in Portland, which is buffered with uh, planters. You can see right there. I had clips from Dearborn Street in downtown Chicago, which is a two-way bike lane. You can see the yellow skip striping there in the center. 
and is buffered by parked cars. Um, Southwest Broadway here through the PSU campus, I had one clip from there which has parked cars and is a one-way protected bike lane. And then we had Milwaukee Avenue which is in, in Chicago, and it, the section I chose is buffered by uh, little plastic posts. It also has sections that are buffered by cars, but I chose the post to get a sample of that. We have Fell Street in Chicago, another one-way bike lane with plastic posts as the buffer. And then Coley Boulevard out here in northeast Portland, which is a slightly raised facility just above the grade of the roadway. And it also features on-street parking as a barrier, although one notable feature about the video was the parking was completely unoccupied during the time of my filming, so it serves as more of, well, what's just the physical space as well as the rays, what type of effect does that have? For my reference clips, I had uh, a section of Southwest Barber Boulevard here just above the PSU campus. Um, it's a moderately, relatively higher to moderately speed road. It has standard bike lane in some places, in others it has a slightly buffered bike lane with a second uh, paint stripe a little bit away from the first. Uh, Knott Street in northeast Portland was my shared street, which is a wider collector street. There's no bike lane, but there's also it's also a relatively wide street. Uh, the Springwater Trail, which for those of you not familiar with that, that is an off-road shared use path. And so I wanted to get that for an idea of how you know these off-street paths compare to on-street facilities. And then I had a bicycle boulevard out in southeast Portland, which has sharrows, traffic calming measures, things like that to keep traffic volumes low and speeds low. And then for another bike lane, I had Multnomah Street beyond where the protected bike lane ends. It goes into a regular bike lane sandwiched between a parked, parked car lane and a travel lane. We administered the survey in two different ways. Uh, the primary administration was in person. So we had people come in. Um, in, three diff in two different locations uh, for three different times. So we did surveys uh, in Oberon Smith Memorial Student Union. That's the room shown in the upper left corner there. And they, we held it during the Portland State Farmers Market that was going on during November. Uh, it was the only farmers market still going, so it was bringing in a more regional crowd than it might otherwise bring in. Uh, we offered an incentive of tokens to be used at the farmers market if you came in and took our 15-minute survey. So we did that twice, um, including once right before Thanksgiving, which is the busiest market of the year. Um, we got about 70 people each time came in to view the surveys. And so what people would do is they would come, they would check in with us, and we would hand them a survey sheet, uh, which you can see there in the upper corner here. And before each clip, it would show the number of the clip. And so they were instructed to find that number on their scoring sheet, watch the 30-second clip, and afterwards, they get a few seconds to rate. How comfortable would you feel if you were the bicyclist in that situation on an A through F scale? So they would go through that, watch all 20 clips. It took about a total of 13, 14 minutes. And then we asked them some basic demographic information, age, uh, how often they bicycle, gender, uh, whether they own a bicycle, and for what purposes they might bicycle. Um, we also did it once at the Oregon Museum of Science Industry during their After Dark event, which is 21 and over only. We chose that one because, one, it's a unique event that brings in people from all over, and two, on a typical day at the museum, you have a lot of families with children. The survey was limited to 18 and over, and it was a lot easier to try to attract people that were, didn't have kids that they couldn't bring in. Um, and when I say it was easier to attract people. It was easy for me because I sat up there and administered the survey while Tara and, uh, and Mark and others went around and grabbed people and brought them in for me. So, We also did it an online version too. Um, the online version results are not included in my final model. Um, I did the online survey just entirely to see what would happen if I just went a much easier route and sent the e just sent an email out to a bunch of you know different transportation groups and bicycle related listservs people that I knew would take the survey because they really liked that kind of thing. Um, and it required very little effort other than a few tweets and some Facebook posts and some emails to some listservs. And it was online, so there was no direct supervision. It could be done whenever. And if I needed more survey responses, I could just send another email out to another group. So I wanted to get an idea of, all right, so if we take a 
a survey method that's a little more intensive, um, but also draws a broader range, well, it draw a broader range of people, first off, and if it does, how do their responses compare to those who just, you know, if you just send a survey out to the Association of Pedestrian and Bicycle Professionals and other transportation related groups. And now I've got a little example of what these clips look like. So that would go on for about 30 seconds. Um, you could, so I, what I didn't mention in my data collection setup before was I had a external microphone mounted to the camera with a windsock on it so we could capture the sounds of motor vehicles going by. Um, that way you can try to better simulate that feeling of, that's a car passing me, not just seeing something on a video and being like, oh, there goes something. Um, there has been previous research on how well this type of survey does compare to in-person surveys and they've generally found that it falls within a 95% confidence range. So statistically, it should produce similar results to what sending people actually out in the field would do, um, having them rate it after they actually physically ride an area, but without the liability issues or having to fly people around to Chicago, San Francisco, and everywhere else to see everything. So now I'm gonna go through the results of the in-person survey. Like I said, that was the primary focus of my data reduction effort. Um, so, Looking first at our sample makeup, uh, we succeeded in one area right away, which was the survey is slightly, leans slightly towards females. Um, typically, what previous studies have found is when you go after a group that is more heavily in the transportation, and bicycling in particular, you tend to wind up with a more heavily male response rate. So we had a pretty evenly distributed group, just slightly female. Um, we also have a good range of ages. It does skew pretty young. You know, the 20 to 30 group is the largest. But we did even have people who were over 70 or over 80 take the survey. Uh, it was the benefit of the farmer's market. You had you know, people coming in town to visit their family in Portland that were coming down to the market too. Um, so our average age was somewhere getting close to 40. Uh, but again, a little heavy on the young side. Uh, as far as people's writing habits, I was uh, pleasantly surprised and happy to see that uh, while we do get a lot of people who do ride pretty regularly for commuting purposes, you know, either three to five times a week or every day, you know, the vast majority of our, our group rides rarely or not at all for commuting purposes. And even then, we still have, you know, a fair, fair amount of the group doesn't ever ride for recreation or other purposes either. So while, this, while these splits here for people that do ride are higher than what you would see if you did a representative survey of the greater population, uh, we still have a pretty good makeup of people who are not those hardcore riders who you know, might skew results to feel more comfortable um, than the general person would. And so we looked at how uh, the different demographics would impact people's ratings. Um, so I took the A through F ratings and converted them to a one through six scale. And I found that age and riding habits were significantly correlated with how a person would rate it. So as a person got older, they tended to feel a little bit less comfortable and as a person rides more often, they tend to feel more comfortable. Um, those results are probably reasonably intuitive to most people uh, and similar with what other research has found. It did find uh, no significant difference in gender. You know, the female respondents tended to rate, be just a slightly le bit less comfortable, but it wasn't within a statistically significant range, which again, previous research on this topic has found some have said yes, gender matters, some have said it doesn't. Um, the other two factors, age and writing habits, tend to be more significant. So, and then we wanted to show, get, just to get a rough idea, don't take this chart as gospel. I saw it get sent around the other day on social media and I got a little nervous because there's a major disclaimer here at the bottom. It was just to get an idea of, all right, generally how does some of the different types of bicycle infrastructure compare? It's just to describe what we're looking at here. And not surprisingly, we see the off-street path and protected bike lanes, that's what the PBL stands for, those tend to be better performers. That's what we expected based on intuition and previous general like stated preference survey research. Uh, we did find that you know, a shared street was less comfortable than an area with a regular bike lane. But we also had some things show up that are a little surprising for people that have seen previous research, like a bike lane with parking next to it 
is a little bit better than a two-way protected bike lane or a, a bike boulevard, but that's more of a factor of we only had one clip for that area. It's not representative of the spectrum of types. It just shows that roads that are less busy, people tend to be more comfortable on them if there's not some type of protected bike lane infrastructure. Uh, and then we looked at the scores based on the different types of buffers. So this is for the protected bike lanes only. And we found that generally people were, while they gave protected bike lanes generally good scores, somewhere in the A to B range on average, um, planters were the most comfortable buffer type, uh, followed by parked cars and then posts last, which you might Makes some, intu some intuitive sense. You know, planters are a good physical barrier. They look nice. You can see over them, so you can see the cars coming by. Parked cars are obviously a very sturdy physical barrier. You don't have to worry too much about a car very often hitting you when there's another car in its way. Um, but at the same time, you can't see over those cars. And so you know, I've heard people express some concern about the visibility of intersections and driveways. And then posts. Posts are a nice reminder, but everyone knows that a post goes down very easy. Uh, when a car is driving over it. Other factors we looked at just to see if they were uh, significantly correlated. Don't worry too much about the numbers. Uh, the main story is that motor, vo motor vehicle volumes and speeds uh, do matter. Same with the number of travel lanes on a road or the width of the buffer or how often there are driveways along the road. But on their own, they're not great predictors. They're pretty weakly correlated. That's there's a complicated interaction of factors that goes into determining how comfortable people feel in bike lanes. So when I was looking at creating the models, I looked at three different basic ideas. The first is a simple lookup index table. I wanted to see, could I just say, hey, if you've got a protected bike lane of this buffer type on a street with this many lanes and this speed, it's a B. And, or if you, could you look it up, could you do something that simple and get relatively quick and easy results that are relatively reliable. And then uh, I looked at two different types of regression models. I looked at a standard least squares regression that most of you are familiar with, you know, y equals mx plus b type of situation. And then I looked at a logistic model, uh, which predicts the odds of, different, of a person rating a model at, rating a protected bike lane at different comfort levels. So the odds they would rate it as an A, the odds they would do it as a B or C or a D. Uh, the variables listed here are the ones that I tried to limit my models generally to. Uh, these are the ones I thought would be the most significant based on the, the data I was showing you there, as well as data that would be generally readily available to a, design, you know, a planner or a design engineer as they go through the process of determining what they want to create. Um, number of travel lanes and motor vehicle volume are italicized here because I use them interchangeably. Um, so my idea was that some agencies have really good ADT uh, databases, but maybe some don't, and vice versa. Some may have good roadway databases with an inventory of the number of lanes, some may not. And could you use those two interchangeably? Would one give you better results? Since roads with higher ADT tend to have more lanes. So I looked at two, those two, two different models. The first one, you'll see here, they all use the same variables at the top, and then it uses number of motor vehicle lanes. Model two substitutes ADT for number of lanes. And model three has a few different variables, the volume in the adjacent lane and the buffer width. Um, because model three, I let the computer just choose for me what variables are most important or that it could fit that might be different than those. Um, for, this is using the regression, uh, the logistic regression model. For those of you who are familiar with it, you'll notice that you know, based on the log likelihood, it's a slightly better model, but not too much better. Um, then I wanted to look at uh, the distribution of responses that would each model would predict compared to what I observed. So those of you who are not familiar with uh, cumulative logistic regression, like I said, what it does is it gives you the odds that someone will rate something at a certain level. So you can also look at it as the proportion of the population that would say, this is an A. So it would tell you that 50% of the people will rate this type of facility as an A, 30% of B, 10% of C, and so on, you know, 5% D, 1% F type of situation. So that's what I tried to capture here in these graphs is I took what people actually rated it, how, you know, so for clip number one, vast majority rated it as an A, good chunk as a B, a few C's, some D's, and E or two down here. 
And then I said, what I looked at how the models compared with their prediction. And you'll see that generally, the models all fit the actual responses pretty well. Um, that model two, the second one up from the bottom, oftentimes provides good or better fit than model three, the one that's a little more complicated. So ultimately, I ended up recommending using that second model since it uses inputs that are a little more readily available and gives you virtually the same performance as the more complicated one. Um, and breaking out the coefficients on the model just to show you what factors matter the most in the model, and buffer type far and away is the biggest predictor of how someone will feel on a protected bike lane. So on a planter buffer, if a bu bike lane has a planter buffer, someone is 700 plus percent more likely to give it a better, one better lighter grade than they would the same facility if all it had was a post buffer. So that's by far the most significant. Uh, the two-way facility was slightly less comfortable than a one-way facility. That comes with the caveat that my two-way clips were all from downtown Chicago, which is a relatively busy urban environment and you, you could kind of get that impression from the videos. So that's something that could use a little bit more work but based on comments I've heard from people, I expect that that trend would generally hold anyway. Uh, let's see, I also worked on a different project here during my time where we intercepted people who were riding on different protected bike lanes. And we asked them on a scale of one to six, you know, how comfortable do you feel riding in this protected bike lane? And so that gave me a nice little comparison to fit my models and my observed survey data to how does it compare to people that are actually writing on facilities, some of which I surveyed in my videos, some of which I did not. And I also wanted to compare, all right, how does my model compare on these facilities to how the Danish model would predict people. So the top of all these graphs is what people actually said from their survey. This is after writing the, after they've written the facility, you know, did they give it, were they A, B, C, D, E, F. The middle one is the Danish model, so that's based on surveys of people in Denmark, and so I applied the model here to see how it would compare. And the bottom is my model. And so what you'll generally see is, I'm just looking here primarily at the A, B range, is the models generally have different levels of fit, but generally my model fits these facilities a little bit better than the Danish model. Um, and this is true even on the facilities that weren't in my study. So like L Street here in Washington, D.C., I did not video it. Um, I visited it at one point in time, but I didn't have my whole camera set up ready to go at the moment. So, but you'll still see that my model generally predicts the observed distribution reasonably accurately. So for those of you wondering how this might actually look as an application form, um, here is an existing road. Um, it's one way, three lanes, you've got on-street parking, about 11,000 ADT, 30 mile an hour speed limit. So if you use the HCM level of service model and analyze that existing conditions today, it would tell you at the link level between the intersections, you have a level of service of D. And so if you're wondering like, what could we do to improve it, if you wanted to use a protected bike lane as a potential option, the HCM doesn't have a method for that. So you could use this model instead. And what you would wind up with is something that looks like this. So you now have say two travel lanes, you moved your parking off the curb and moved it over here, and now you have a protected bike lane similar to the one on Southwest Broadway Street out here. And so you wanna know, well, how is that gonna compare? All right, right now, level of service D, I'm not getting a lot of people out to ride on this road that aren't very confident bicyclists. Will this help people, will this bring more people out? Is this gonna be more comfortable? And so, here are the equations uh, for those of you that want to see what it actually looks like in practice. I won't spend much time at all on these, but you'll see you input a few different constants in here. Here's your ADT, and it spits out a 0.53. So that means 53% of people would rate this as an A. You go down and you do it again, 32% of B. And so what you end up with is a, di a distribution that looks like this. And so you would say, all right, so over half the people will now say we have a, in terms of my comfort. Going up, 80% or more will say a B. You've got another percentage to C, D, and F. And so how would you report your level of service then though for this? I mean, you have a distribution, which is good because you can understand like what it looks like to different people. Um, but in terms of if you just want to report a single letter grade, there's a couple of different ways you could do it. 
You could make a cutoff and say, all right, what do half the people say? You could go more stringent and define some other percentile, like what's my 85th percentile rating or my 75th percentile rating. Or you could do a weighted average and wind up with a B in this case. If you were to say, all right, multiply the percentages times the letter and figure out what you get. So you probably would report this as an A or a B most likely, depending on what you used as your cutoff. And then for the index table, um, if you wanted something quick and simple, this is what it generally looks like, where you're, if you have all these conditions present here, you have an A. If you have these conditions present over here, you wind up, if any of these conditions are present, you wind up with a B. Um, you'll notice that I don't have anything with speeds above 35 miles an hour. Those were not included in the study, and I'll talk a little bit more about some of those limitations here in a second. And generally, that table fits pretty well. It was off in a couple of locations from the predicted median score to the observed median score. Um, so it provides a good approximation um, and could be used too. And for those of you interested in it, how the online survey turned out, uh, people that are a little more detail oriented on surveys. Um, I got an older group of people, average age of 43 as opposed to 36. It did turn out, as it has in the past, uh, substantially more male. Instead of just under half of respondents being male, we had two thirds of the respondents being male. Um, they bicycled a lot more. You know, it's, there's no point in showing you the graph, just it was a lot more. Um, and even controlling for all those factors, we generally found that people, you know, so say a man age 35 who rides five times a day, I mean five times a week for commuting purposes, if he took that survey online versus in person, his online score would be about a quarter point on average worse. So we did find a little bit of a degradation just for um, the survey administration of that. Not sure exactly why that is. It could be you know, people having different video qualities or different sound qualities. They're turning it up way too loud and it's sounding very intimidating. Um, or it just looks grainy and doesn't look like a fun place. Um, or there could be some other demographic factor we're not capturing here. So in conclusion, uh, I would recommend that second model, the one that I showed the distributions of at the end and compared um, the fits to. That's the one I would recommend to be used. Uh, uses readily available inputs for the most part. And um, it had pretty good accuracy in terms of not just the survey response data, but actual intercept surveys of people on facilities that weren't tested in the development of the model. Um, I would be a little hesitant to use the model outside of some of the ranges I'm showing up here. Um, I did test it on some, say, like low volume facilities, and it wasn't quite on. Um, same time, if you have a protected bike lane on a road with 3080T, you can probably guess people are going to feel pretty comfortable. You probably don't need a model to tell you that. Um, it's nice if it does and you have that confirmation, but I think it's a reasonable assumption too. Um, and so these are all the, the ranges that I actually had, though, in my study. So you'll notice with planters, park cars, and posts, got three common buffer types that you're going to see in a lot of protected bike lanes, but there may be some more innovative treatments or other treatments that do come up that aren't necessarily covered. Um, like I mentioned, the one with Coley Street, the parking was unoccupied, so I don't have a, a raised protected bike lane separated by buffered cars in here. So if you were to want to apply this to an area like that, you could probably still use it, maybe tweak it a little bit. but you'd want to be cautious of your results. Um, if you might get something, if something doesn't look right, that could be why you're just going outside the valid range of the model. Secondarily, not surprisingly, we found that protected bike lanes, people generally feel more comfortable in them than they do in other on-street infrastructure. That's something that other research has found just when they show a picture. So showing them a moving video, we get the same result. Uh, intercepting them for the other project I mentioned, same result. Um, Buffer type is by far the most significant uh, variable in the model. If you have a protected bike lane, it's what really differentiates them, um, more so than traffic volume or other features. One-way versus two-way does matter. Two-way protected bike lanes are going to feel a little less comfortable. Um, like I said, my model may exaggerate just how less comfortable, just given it was only based on one in downtown Chicago. But I believe the general trend will still hold, and it's a relatively slight impact compared to the buffer type, so I don't know how significant the difference would be if I had more facilities. 
Um, the motor vehicle volumes do matter. ADT works as a pretty good substitute, though. Instead of going out and getting a peak hour count in the adjacent lane, uh, you get pretty similar results just by using your AADT. Um, and then if you are ever going to conduct some type of similar survey, know that the administration method does matter as well as how you advertise it. You know, if you broadcast it out to transportation groups, you will get those people who are more interested in these issues, who bicycle more often, and there's going to be a bias that comes out of that. Um, as well as if you do it online versus in person, there's going to be some level of bias that happens too because of the method. <clears throat> there's a few limitations to this model. It was kind of meant to be a first attempt at something like this. It was done for a master's thesis, not a well-funded national research project, which I could conscript people to attend with vast monetary rewards. Um, so, like I said, there's a, a limit to the range of protected bike lanes I had in there, uh, particularly on the two-way side. Uh, as well as the traffic conditions, I would have really liked to have had like a 45 mile an hour road or something with some higher speeds beyond 35 miles an hour to see does the, does the effect of having that protective buffer still hold at those higher speeds or does it all bets are off once traffic starts going that fast. Um, intersections, as you might imagine, are an area where protection generally disappears. You, know, you can't have a row of parked cars through an intersection and expect vehicles to still be able to turn. So that's going to feel different. We did not include them in this model, um, but that would be an area definitely for future research and probably the most important area for future research on the topic in this area. Um, because we, if you go out to four or five different protected bike lanes, you're going to see four or five different intersection treatments. It's just not a great standard way everyone's doing it right now. Um, for people that are really hardcore into video production, if you watched one of my videos, you might catch a couple things with my frame rate or something that wasn't perfect. Uh, I found out later on. I think it didn't really did a good job, but a few people that were really into it were like, uh, if you had slowed your frame rate down and changed this, it would have looked a lot better when you smoothed it. So there it is. Um, also, that metal post that I used to hold the camera on, it vibrated a fair amount, um, although I was able to smooth it using a post-processing video software, and it did a generally good job. Uh, I was able to compare these videos to what was used to develop the highway capacity manuals uh, level of service model. Um, so thanks to Sprinkle Consulting for sharing those with me. And it was pretty comparable, um, largely because video, tech, video data collection technology has come a long way since mid-2000s. Um, and finally, well, my sample demographics were a pretty broad group. Um, I had a lot of people that didn't bicycle, a lot of people that were a little older, good gender range. Um, it still tends to be more young and bicycle more often than the general population. So it's not wholly representative. Um, I know some people are also concerned about the fact that the surveys have been done only in Portland. And Portland is home to all kinds of people who, have, who are more interested in bicycling and have their own views. Um, and so that may be biasing the survey some. We tried to mitigate that to an extent by having it in areas where we'd get a little bit of a regional population, although you know, farmer's markets still may attract a certain type of person, and maybe that type of person feels differently about bicycling than if it conducted these at, you know, Washington Square Mall or the Clackamas Town Center or something like that. Um, although previous research has been mixed on whether this matters. Um, when the Federal Highway Administration did their bicycle compatibility index back in the late 90s, uh, they surveyed a number of locations across the country and found that the location the survey took place in had virtually no impact on it. Um, the highway capacity manual study found, yeah, the big cities were different than the small cities, and one city was different than the other three, but um, the degree to which it matters wasn't fully clear, and so I'm not sure that that really does impact things too much, although there may be a bit of an impact. When it comes to protected bike lanes, Portland really doesn't have very many. It's not a common thing around here unless all you do is ride by the Lloyd Center or on Coley or Broadway Street here. It's they're not found everywhere. In I would say like a place like Chicago, you might get a little bit more of a bias where they put them in in a lot of places. So in that regard, I think Portland's a little bit less biased. So uh, the implications uh, for practical research is that this model could be used out there today to help people understand, will a protected bike lane improve my level of service here? Is that going to be an appropriate way to get people more comfortable? Um, I'd be careful to use it only within the ranges I've identified here, though. Like I said, you may get some interesting results if you take it too far beyond. Um, in the future, I would really like to see some intersection work done um, to get a better understanding of how people feel with different types of treatments, whether it's shared mixing zones or 
right-hand side lanes. Um, and if it ever one gets built in the U.S., one of the full protected intersections that you've seen Nick Falvo and others talk about. Um, and also be good to see uh, maybe a more comprehensive look at all types of on-street infrastructure into one model instead of having separate models for different types of infrastructure. Um, moving to more of a form instead of some of the other models use just straight regular linear regression, which can produce results that don't make any sense and are well beyond the range of a 1 through 6 survey, and you get a result of everyone will say this is a 12. It doesn't quite fit. Um, so having something more like this with a logistic regression model where you can see the proportion of people and how they fit into the different categories gives you a little bit better picture of how the facility really looks to people. So finally, I'd like to thank uh, Chris Munzier and Jennifer Dillon, Kelly Clifton of Portland State, who served on my thesis committee. Chris was the chair back there. Um, if you have questions, if you, if you don't get to ask me here today, you can shoot me an email at the email address up there. Um, my thesis is available online through Portland State's website. And for those of you going to TRB, a uh, much more condensed version of it that will be much more readable um, and a little bit more applicable, it will also soon be available there too. So with that, any questions? Yeah. Uh, there was any discussion or evaluation of the presence of pedestrians. Um, just thinking we do have some places in Portland where the comfort level is affected by like the movie cycle track or waterfront park where you're also not just cars, but you might be actually just sharing the path with pedestrians. Yes, so I was looking at exclusive bike-only uh, lanes. So these are meant you know, for bicycle travel only. Now, having said that, pedestrians can still impact that. Uh, whether it's as you've seen, if you've been out in the Broadway Street protected bike lane, you to think that there's never pedestrians standing in it or doing anything besides just walking across it. Yeah, that's that's not what happens. And especially in Chicago, you had people people could queue up. I tried to when I was going through looking at the videos. If some, there was a blatant pedestrian standing in the way or that type of issue, I'd cut that out so that would be less of an influence. Um, I just didn't use that clip. Now, could that be one of the things that makes Chicago's clips a little bit less desirable in some of these other locations? Because you do have people on the side of the road all the time. It's possible that could be one of the things contributing. But it wasn't something I explicitly asked for. Krista? Yeah, I try not to include those because I wasn't sure what the effect that might have. Um, and I had limited opportunities to, and one of those things, if I had more opportunities to do it, I would have. But um, that was only going to be an issue in a couple of these where, you, like Milwaukee Avenue, which sees thousands of cyclists a day and pretty aggressive ones at that. I mean, that might skew how that one was viewed. So I tried to not include clips of Milwaukee that had a lot of people passing you. But I would certainly expect that if you were not comfortable having a bunch of people flying by, it would change that a little bit. I know when I was riding around with my, I tried to ride at an average speed, you know, keep it in that 12, 15 mile an hour range, and so I got passed a lot in Chicago. <laughs> yeah. Curious, uh, with your video survey of the Springwater Corridor, what were the results of that? Was that fairly high rated, or were there some interesting D's and E's and S's? There are a few people that rated that one low. I don't have, the, I don't remember the exact distribution. The average score was really close to one, which is an A. If I scrolled way back in here, I could pull it up. Um, yeah, there. So the average score, you can see here, is just barely past an A at 220 observations. So yeah, there were a few people. Um, I, I would expect that if I'd gone back and looked at it, they were ones that you know, maybe don't bicycle ever and just will never feel comfortable, which is good that they were in the survey. Um, but yeah, it was, you could tell without knowing which clip number it was by looking at the sheets, you knew which one it was after a while. <laughs> yeah, in the back. I personally haven't thought too much about that. That would be an interesting study, though. Um, you know, for the project I worked on here where we intercepted the bicyclists on some of these protected bike lanes, we did also mail out surveys uh, to residents that live nearby and ask them, hey, do you drive along this road? And if you drive, how do you, you know, what do you think? And we 
we generally found driver support for them. Um, I would assume because it gives them you know, some level of, they know where bicycles are going to be. You know, they're not worried about sharing the road as much. Um, they're, they're, they know they're going to be there, not likely to be darting out in front, especially if there's parked cars. You know, it's hard to go in between them. Um, so there was a small, it was a majority, but it was you know, relatively small. They thought it was better. A lot of had no opinion, too. Is that, am I getting that one right, Nathan, Tara? <laughs> Feel like there was anything that people that side found disorienting? Where you know, where we have a high-profile left-hand suffer tech that the bike lane here is disorienting <laughs> some uh, some people. Yeah, riding home at night. I don't think I, I, don't think I, I, I considered that too much. The closest I kind of came to looking at that explicitly was I did break out here. I broke out whether or not if you're riding with traffic or against traffic on a two-way bike lane. So our that was the closest I got to that explicitly. Um, and while I, I did find a slight difference, it wasn't s significant. Um, yeah. I'm going to hypothesize some of it has to do with a certain level of expectation. You know, these facilities are more common in Denmark, um, so there's going to be some of that happening. There's also going to be, I have to go back and look, but if I remember correctly, the Danish model, um, they had a very, they had a very good incentive and they got a wider range of, pe they got, they got tend to get more people out that maybe don't, wouldn't be as comfortable as some of the people that took my survey bicycle. You know, I've, you're a person who rides more <coughs> in Denmark, slightly different demographic than here in the U.S. And so there may be they got a wider spread of people, and so they got a wider range of comforts, whereas when we're intercepting people, we're getting people that already feel some level of confidence riding it, and that's what my model is matching. So that may indicate my model is somewhat skewed towards people who are more likely to ride. Um, so whereas there, they had, they had a wider range. It's yeah. a good question. Yeah. Um, I just had a, a thought about the, uh, the online one, why that was so much different than the first one, because I've interfaced a lot with, you know, a lot of these, uh, transportation advocates, these online communities, and I think what it is is that a lot of them see this advocacy as they're used to doing public agency surveys where they're experienced, but they're quote-unquote uncomfortable because they want the better facilities, so they say, oh yeah, this one is horrible, because... I, they want to the balance step in theory, yeah. Well, but yeah. I wouldn't really trust them. <laughs> That's another one to add to the, add to the possibilities, yeah. For questions, and I know some students have things written down that they want to ask. For a question, I'm not a student. But. So one of your, um, looking at the observed comfort compared to the Danish model, compared to your model. But one of them, the observed comfort was a lot higher than either of the models. I think, um, let's say, maybe it was one of the, the screen before this, or the, the similar screen before this. Um, okay, let's go back to this. <laughs> <laughs> Next slide, maybe? Is that, oh, did you see it too? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm not um, that makes the question I could have. So the top one? It helps. The top one here is the observed. The bottom two are models. Okay, I guess we got we got here where we've got the models saying everyone's more comfortable on Oak Street than they really feel. Is that it? Well, I guess I mean the question was kind of well, how do you, you know, look at the specifics of what's there to kind of pick apart what the model is not capturing, and I guess and, I mean, that kind of applies to some of these ones that are a little bit. Do you have any hypothesis why the models generally underpredicted the E's and F scores? It seems like the observed are a lot more than models would predict. Yeah, that is an interesting question. I 
noticed. I'm not 100% sure why that's happening. Um, could be some level of skew or bias in the results. Um, you know, maybe once people actually do ride, you start to get a wider range. That was part of the people that the observed ones are the people they rode through intersections. Yeah. So, so you would expect that the people that rode through intersections would have a lower perception than the yeah. people that only saw the same. Sorry, that's written in my thesis. That's <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, so when we. So we just ask people, like, just riding up and down the street, how do you feel? And so you're, there's going to be a level of intersections um, that are taken into account here. And what this also doesn't show is the Danish model does include an intersection component that could be added in that may calibrate its overall results a little bit better. But what I wanted to get at here was, could you just go ahead right now and just use this to get a good enough approximation even without the intersection component? And yeah, as you pointed out, it skews a little bit, but intersections only have so much of an impact. Yeah. You mentioned that those so, so they uh, recorded how often they rode, mm -hmm. but did they um, mention the environment they're used to riding in? Or no, I only had just asked like what type of reason they ride and how often. It seems like it, you know somebody. You said a lot of people at the time of year that they came and surveyed. A lot of people were visiting Portland. Mm -hmm. and, you know, someone came from Estacada, and you know they weren't used to the urban environment. So yeah. People that would be, that could affect things too. Yeah. But no, we wanted to keep the demographic question short and simple. The idea was to kind of keep the whole experience to about 15 minutes or less. And I didn't want people getting turned off by three pages of detailed questions about everything else. Yeah. Um, but that, yeah, that, would cer that could certainly be an impact. And I think that's kind of what I was getting at earlier when I was talking about the locations where uh, the highway capacity study did find, like, between a major million plus metro area and a smaller area like College Station, Texas, there was a difference in how people perceive things when they watch videos. So yeah, you would certainly, and it, someone from Estacada would be different than someone from inner Southeast Portland, um, just by the fact that they're in different areas. Yeah. Okay, so just a reminder, no seminar next week. You should be uh, sleeping off your turkey or whatever else you're going to have. So, uh, so we'll see you in two weeks for the last seminar of the quarter, and thanks, Nick.